Christ destroyed our death. In rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Charles put on Christ. So in Christ, may Charles be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But when we know, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. words of grace. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. And because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we have gathered here today to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Charles Ivey. We come together in grief acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow hope, and in death resurrection. If you'll all join me in your bulletins for our opening prayer. And you'll be praying with me the bold part. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in vain and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. Especially we praise you for Charles, whom you have graciously received into your presence. 
To all of these, grant your peace. Let perpetual light shine upon them, and help us so to believe where we have not seen, that your presence may lead us through our years, and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. words from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my cry. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If thou, Lord, should mark inequities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is great mercy. With him is plenteous redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all their sins. Now hear these words from Isaiah chapter 40, various verses. It says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her, that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. <coughs> the uneven ground shall become level, and rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and from all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken, and a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. And when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God. The creator of the ends of the earth, he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you'll once again, please turn with me in your bulletin and let us pray the 23rd Psalm together. Let's pray. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not go on. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now hear these words from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God, and they will be his peoples, and God, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every, every, away every tear from their eye, and death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated, who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It's done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. And our gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the gospel of John chapter 14, various verses. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not, do not let them be afraid. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you. Lord, you're our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On behalf of the family, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here today. For all of your calls, your visits, food, your prayers, but most of all for being part of Charles Ivey's life, whether that's as family member or a friend or a friend of the family. I have the family. Thank you for being here. Charles Hubert Ivey, a big man, a tall man. I did not have the privilege of knowing Mr. Ivey as much as I would like to, I visited with him many times over the last couple of three weeks, but I didn't get to know him other than I went to his 90th birthday party when I first moved to Coates a little over five years ago. And he was a presence at that birthday party. And you could tell that his family adored him. I hope if I get close to 95, I, I have as much whereabouts and strength as Mr. Charles Ivey had. Mr. Charles was a daddy to Joan and Carletta and Charles Ivey Jr. And if I call Mr. Charles, Charles Sr. is cause in our, in our prayer list at church, it was always Charles Sr. and Charles Jr. <laughs> when we were praying for both of them. But he was a daddy to Joan, Carletta, and Charles Jr. A papa to Lee and Curtis and Adam, Chris and Elizabeth. And I don't know what the grand, great grandkids call them, but I guess a, grand, a, a great papa. <laughs> to Cameron, Kate, Everett, Spencer, Emma, and Cara. 
and I hope I got everybody's name right. He was an uncle to many people. He, Chuck, Mr. Ivy had a lot of siblings, so a big family. How many of your family of Mr. Ivy that's here today? Or nephews and nieces? Y'all have good genes. <laughs> he was a special friend to Lon, Lonnie and Sally Dorman. Uh, are they here, Lonnie and Sally? So I can put a face to you. A good friend to Lonnie and Sa Sally Dorman. A good friend to Miss Edna Lockerman, who's a member of Coates Methodist Church, and to many others. A father figure to Pete and Don, his, his son-in-laws, and they looked up to him. A father figure to Paul Parker, who's here today. Paul told me, shared that with me a few moments ago. Mr. Ivey was a farmer as a young man. He had to quit school when he was nine or 10 years old because his father died. And he was the only boy left at home and he has a farm. And his older brothers came and helped him and told him what to do. But he was a hardworking man. Drove a truck for a period of time and worked 47 years, is that right? At Burlington Industries. A hard worker. And the family, when I sat down with them yesterday, this is kind of their descriptive words of Mr. Ivy. And I like this first one, a gentle giant. He was a big man. Uh, Joan or Carlotta one told me when he went to the hospital, one of these last trips, he had to get up to use the restroom and as a tall young man helping him out, and he told Mr. Ivy he was tall. And Mr. Ivy said, well, you're a tall dude too, tall man too, what do you do? <laughs> and I think the young man said he played all the sports and all that kind of stuff. But I like this word, they said he was humble. They said he loved family gatherings, mainly because he was probably the center of attention at the family <laughs> gatherings and his birthday parties. And that one party that I went to, you could tell that he was a happy man there. But he loved his grandchildren and his daughters and his son very much. And his adopted daughters and son, Paul and the Dormans, Don and Pete. Adam told me that he was had an even temperament, that he was very chill and laid back. <laughs> and I believe that just from what I know of Mr. Ivy. And I, I like those words, an even temperament. They said he was patient. He was smart. He was a hard worker and he taught John and Carletta and Charles Jr. many lessons about work and money. They said twice, two or three times during my meeting the other day with them, that he, they said, if you go to work, you spend half your money and you save half your money. And he meant that. And something must have took hope because his two dollars work in the banking system. <laughs> so something must have worked somewhere there. Now they said he was also a disciplinarian and he could look at them and cut his eyes and they would know to stop doing whatever they were supposed to do. But Carletta shared with me that her and Charles Jr. would wait to watch him leave work to go across the road to play with the neighbors after Mr. Ivy had told him, you need to stay home. Well, one day he left and he drove around the block <laughs> and they saw the car leave and they went across the road and he pulled up. And uh, that's not the end of the story, but <laughs> I'll tell you later about that. And then Joan told me, and I, this is hard to believe, Joan said she skipped school as a senior in high school. <laughs> and her mother made her sit down when she found out and sit down and Carletta said this was an event. And they were waiting her and Charles Jr. to see what was going to happen and said that Mr. Ivy walked in the house and their mother said, you need to whoop her. <laughs> And he asked what they do, what she do, and they said she skipped school, and he shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I guess you need to whoop her. <laughs> she must have loved you a lot. <laughs> Don told me that he could fix anything. There was nothing he couldn't do. They said he loved games and he loved cards. And they said that he was there to help you do anything he could for anybody that, that needed help. But I want to ask now the congregation and some of the rest of you, what, in one or two words, describe Mr. Ivy to you? Just call them out. Great fisherman. Great fisherman. Yeah. Great brother. A great what? Brother. Great brother. My brother. Yes. My sister. <laughs> Anybody else? He was a true friend. A true friend. Yes. A true friend. 
Anybody else? It was funny. Funny? I won't get to that. <laughs> Anybody else? Family, from the looks on the faces behind you, you can't see them. Your daddy was loved. And he meant a lot to each and every person here today. They did tell me that Mr. Ivy was a prankster. Miss Edna Lockamy, who's 92 years old, the ghost of our church, who's in the nursing home in Harnett Woods now, she loved Mr. Ivy. They rode back and forth to work for many years. And I was the one that had to tell her that Mr. Ivy had passed because every time I go to see her, every week, she asked how Charles was doing. And she wished she could be here today, and she just cried and cried when I told her that Mr. Ivy had passed. But they told me that on the way to work one day, Mr. Ivy, Mr. Ivy was a prankster. And he was going to get her something with an alligator, and they were going to make that thing pop out when she got into the car. And she went to get in the car, and that alligator popped out, and she fell out of the car and went and rolled across the ditch. <laughs> Scared her to death. And then Adam shared with me at Christmas. It was Adam and Curtis and, and, and I guess your brother Chris uh, or Lee was there. And Mr. Ivy gave them all an envelope, had an envelope pass out at Christmas, and then an acorn, just an acorn. And Adam, being the youngest, ended up with the acorn. And he was loaded out until he opened it up and there was a $50 bill inside it. <laughs> but they said he loved to play games. He loved Christmas time and having the family, the grandkids, and his, his children there with him. And they said Chris said that, or Adam said that him and Chris got a Nintendo one year for Christmas. And then Mr. Ivy and somebody else was playing the duck hunt. Y'all remember the duck hunt and went whack, whack, and then shoot, you shoot, the, shoot the ducks on the TV and they fall over there. They could, Adam and Chris couldn't play their game because Mr. Ivy was playing. He thought that was playing. <laughs> they did tell me he loved to fish. He loved to hunt, hunt rabbits and run dogs. He loved to watch westerns, mysteries, Will of Fortune, watch Charles Stanley and other preachers on TV, loved old hymns and the Gaither gospel shows that come on TV. I love a lot of that same stuff. His grandsons love to spend their days with Papa, fishing or playing games or I'm sure just being with him and learning lessons from him. But this is what I found interesting when talking to the family because they kept talking about how he liked to fish, but Mr. Ivy couldn't swim. Now, I grew up somebody that always knew how to swim and I just thought everybody knew how to swim. But Carlin and, and John can't swim either. <laughs> But he was fishing when he was in his 80s now, get this, he was fishing with somebody that one of his relatives in his 80s, and that per they were floundering and gigging or something like that, and that person fell out of the boat and he couldn't swim. But Mr. Ivy at 80 years old, this tells the strength of this man, reached out and pulled him out of the water back into the boat. Are you here, whoever he pulled out of the water? Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> but in his 80s, think about that. Anybody here in your 80s? Or close, Ted. <laughs> I could see you, Ted, pulling Buster out of the water. <laughs> well, what strength he had. They told me that Adam was a good baseball player. And Mr. Ivy was not a big sports fan, but he loved to watch his grandkids. And Adam was getting better in baseball. And finally, uh, Mr. Ivy told him he'd give him $5 for every home run he hit. Well, the better he got, the more home runs he was hitting. And he said it was like pulling money from a tight <laughs> to get the money out of Mr. Ivy. <laughs> but Mr. Ivy, as I said before, was a smart, smart man, and, and the family told me this. He didn't really learn how to re read until later in life. He quit school when he was 9 or 10 years old to work. But he taught himself how to read enough. He would watch TVs on PBS or Channel 4 or whatever it is. He took some lessons and some tutoring to learn how to read. And he was smart to fix anything. He always knew what his bills were, how much they had to spend at their place at the beach, what his bills were at home. Even to this late date in his age at 95, he knew what medicines to take. He may not have been able to tell, tell you what they were all called. 
but he knew what they were looked like and what they were for. And he didn't fully trust Joan and Carletta to give them <laughs> But they finally got to where they would pick it out for him, and he'd look it over and look it over, and yeah, that looks right. And he would take the medicine. And this last week or so, they had to give him a, some a shot of antibiotics. And they practiced and practiced, you could imagine, to make sure they got it right. And, they were practicing together, and it was time for Joan to give him a thing, a shot, and Carletta wasn't there. He said, you sure you can do this? <laughs> but they got him his shots, and he got his meds. <clears throat> but I think he trusted you two more than you'll ever know. It was his way of giving you a hard time and saying he loved you. You can tell what kind of a man... Mr. Ivy, Charles, and his wife were man and woman, and husband and wife they were by the children they raised. I didn't have the good fortune. I met Charles Ivy Jr. just a time or two, and he was a good man. But to own and Carletta go to the church I serve, and I know they are wonderful, and our church couldn't run without them. But you can look at them and look at their kids and just talk to them for about five minutes, and you know Mr. Ivy has rubbed off on a lot of you. I know he loved each and every one of you with all of his great big heart. I'm sure his heart was bigger than his stature. But I was thinking about the word just in my short time of visiting with Mr. Ivy. What word would I say that Mr. Ivy had that described him? And that word is a presence. He had a presence about him. Even laying in the hospital bed. He's 6'2". He's a big man. But he had this presence about him that I knew he was proud of his family and that he loved his family. And I try to think when I do a funeral, what story in the Bible would go along with Mr. Ivy's life? And I, I try to think about, and I even Googled, just to see what Google say. Who are the people of presence in the Bible? But you can think of a hundred that, that had that presence about them when they walked in a room. That presence about them when you think of them. When the grandkids think of him, I'm sure you're thinking, he's a gentle giant. He's my papa. That's a presence in your life that will always be there. He's a daddy for John and Carletta. And I kept going back and forth of who I thought I would think, I thought Mr. Ivy was more like and who had this big presence in their life. And I, 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 I narrowed it down to two people. Uh, Job is one of them. But Joseph was the other from the Old Testament. And Job and Joseph, their stories are somewhat similar. Neither one of them, they had good parts of their lives and they had bad parts of their lives. And I'm going to talk about Joseph. Y'all, everybody knows the story of Joseph. Joseph was the youngest, next to the youngest, of a bunch of brothers. And they didn't like him. Now, I understand Mr. Ivy's brothers and sisters loved him. But, but Joseph's brothers didn't like him. And they tried to sell him. First, they were going to kill him. They said, well, we better not do that. So we're going to sell him to these uh, slave traders that were coming by. So they sold Joseph. And Joseph ended up going to this guy's home and he, he ended up working so hard that he became the head of the household as far as taking care of the yard and the house and the gardens and all the other slaves that were there because he was smart and he knew God was with him. But then Joseph had some bad things happen in his life and, 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 and his slave owner's wife tried to seduce him. And, and he ran away from her and, and he tried to run away from that and she grabbed part of his garment and she told her husband when he got home, look what he did, and he ends up going to jail. It's a terrible thing, but he made the best of it. He ended up running the jail, and people started coming to him because God had given him this gift of interpreting dreams, and he finally gets out of jail, and he ends up at the Pharaoh's house, or the, the Pharaoh in Egypt, and he, and he takes over all of Egypt, and the, and the Pharaoh gives him command of all of Egypt. He took something bad, from what his brothers did, what his slave master did, what the jail did, to end up doing something good and he ended up saving his family. And now I want to talk about Job just a little bit. Job was a good, righteous man, a man of presence in his community. And the devil made a bet with God and he said, I bet you I can make Job curse you, God. 
and turn away from you. And God said, okay, do what you want, but you can't touch him. So the devil went and he took away his wife, took away his children, took away most of his money. And Job still didn't curse God. So finally he said, let me do something to him physically. I won't kill him, but let me do something. So then he got leprosy or something, some kind of sores all over him. And Job hung in there, had some bad days. But Job persevered because of his presence and the presence God had in his life. And where I think about Mr. Ivy with Job is Mr. Ivy lost his father at a young age. That's a terrible thing for a young man to have to go through. My dad lost his dad when my dad was eight years old, so I've heard stories. Had to quit school to farm, to take care of his mother. He lost his wife at some point. He lost a grandson. He lost his son. Probably most of his friends have died. When you live to 95 years old, that happens. But did that change who Mr. Ivy was? He was still a man of presence, I believe. And he knew that God was there, taking care of all the loved ones that he had lost. It's that temperament that his grandson talked about. That chill laid back. It probably helped get him through things. That's what Jesus can do for us, folks. Mr. Ivy knew Jesus was with him. When I was over there last Wednesday before he passed on Thursday, he was hurting. And he was saying, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And they had to come in and they tried to set him up for some reason. I can't even remember why. And it was excruciating pain for Mr. Charles. Carlette and Joan were there 12 hours a day, and they both saw this. And that's hard to watch your dad go through that. I know it is. But know that you're at the top of his heart. Because you girls loved him. And he loved you. But I asked him, I asked Carlette and Joan, I said, what do you think Charles Jr. said to him the other day when he got to heaven? And Carlette, I think, said, what took you so long to get here? <laughs> but could you imagine Mr. Charles today, as much as he liked the family gatherings that y'all had at Coates and different places and when you got around family, can you imagine what it was like for him that day he walked into heaven on Thursday morning to see his mother and his father, to see all of his brothers, but to see his son, Charles Ivy Jr., and his grandson, Curtis, I couldn't imagine what joy it was in their hearts Thursday morning in heaven when the angels were shouting and singing. Hosanna in the highest, another saint has come home. Because that's what Mr. Charles Ivy is, a saint. And I look here at the family and all of his family and friends out here. I know he was loved. And I know he loved you. Because that's how he lived his life. In our scripture reading this morning in church, we talked about there's going to be suffering. If you're a Christian and you have Christ in your heart, you're going to suffer in this life. There's going to be suffering for the days ahead because I see all the tears in a congregation right now. And God wants you to cry. And he shows that you love Mr. Charles. Papa, daddy, cousin, uncle, friend. But when these tears start to fade, there's going to be more and more smiles coming and more and more laughter coming. Share the good news of what Mr. Charles Ivey meant to you. Share the stories. I know these great grandkids know a lot of the stories, but there's a lot more I'm sure they don't know. Tell them the good and the bad ones, the ones you don't think they're ready for yet, because that's a good thing to know. And carry on this legacy, this fine legacy, Mr. Charles and his wife started so many years ago. Be thankful you had your daddy for 95 years. And what a wonderful man he is. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
and to you with your church on earth and in heaven. We offer honor and glory now and forever. Amen. O oh God, that all that you have given us is yours. As first you gave Charles to us, now we give Charles back to you. Receive Charles into the arms of your mercy. Raise Charles up with all your people. Receive us also and raise us into a new life. Help us so to love and serve you in this world that we may enter into your joy in the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us even to this day. For the gift of joy and days of health and strength and for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in the days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and friends and for our baptism and place in your church with all who have faithfully lived and died. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus who knew our griefs who died our death and rose for our sake, and who lives and prays for us. And as he taught us so, now we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou hast king, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will the congregation please stand? Give this benediction. Now may the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, according to the riches of God's glory, grant you to be strengthened with might through God's Spirit in your inner being that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. Friends, the service will continue over the Coke City Cemetery.